On this graph, you can see two different curves on the same graph. The y-axis represents cardiac output or venous return, and that's in liters per minute. The x-axis shows either right atrial pressure or left ventricular end diastolic volume, depending on which curve you're looking at. The two curves in this diagram are the vascular function curve, which is the one that starts in the bottom left and slopes upward to the right and says CO at the end. This curve represents cardiac output and how cardiac output increases as left ventricular end diastolic volume increases as well. And this is a representation of the ability of the heart to increase cardiac output as preload increases. So this is a way for the body to correct for increased venous return as an increase in cardiac output. The downsloping curve that says venous return indicates how venous return decreases as right atrial pressure increases. These data are obtained experimentally, and what they show is if you simply raise the right atrial pressure without changing any other pressures in the heart, this actually decreases venous return back to the heart, because as you know, venous return requires a low right atrial pressure in order to move blood back to the heart. So increasing right atrial pressure from left to right causes venous return to drop. These two curves, the vascular function curve and the venous return curve, are affected by different things. And this is why we need two different curves to dictate what the cardiac output will be in a person. For example, increasing inotropy shifts the cardiac output curve up and to the left, whereas decreasing inotropy shifts it down and to the right. Changing inotropy does not change the venous return curve. It's just the vascular function curve or the cardiac output curve. Therefore, that curve is affected by inotropy either positively or negatively. The venous return curve, however, is affected by blood volume, for example, giving a patient a blood transfusion. And therefore, an increase in blood volume shifts the venous return curve up and to the right while taking blood away from the patient, such as with hemorrhage, shifts the venous return curve down and to the left. Where these two curves intersect at the center of the graph is called the operating or steady state point of the heart. Normally, venous return equals cardiac output. So the point at which these two curves intersect is the operating point of the heart, where the cardiac output and the venous returns are equal. The reason that this graph exists is to help you predict what different events such as increasing inotropy or decreasing inotropy, will have on the cardiac output of the patient. It's also important to understand that the venous return curve intercepts the x-axis at a certain point. That point is called mean systemic pressure. What the mean systemic pressure is, is the pressure in all of the blood vessels in the body and the heart if the heart were to stop beating. And as you can see, as you increase blood volume, you shift the venous return curve to the right and increase the mean systemic pressure. The opposite occurs when you decrease blood volume. Next, we'll discuss the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle can be shown as a pressure volume loop. You can see that pressure here is in the y-axis and volume is in the x-axis. By moving from left to right, you increase volume, and from moving down to up, you increase pressure. There are different phases of left ventricular cardiac cycle. We will start at point one. Point one is seen at the right side of the graph, and it goes from mitral valve closure to aortic valve opening. And this phase is called isovolumetric contraction. It's called isovolumetric contraction because the volume remains approximately the same going from mitral valve closure to aortic valve opening. This is a very short phase and is the beginning of systole. The next phase, phase two, which you can see at the top of the pressure volume loop, is the systolic ejection phase. And this is the period between the aortic valve opening and the aortic valve closing. 
The ejection phase occurs after the pressure in the left ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta. The next phase, or phase three, which is at the left side of the diagram, is isovolumetric relaxation. And this occurs between aortic valve closing and mitral valve opening. This is also a relatively short phase. The next phase is phase four, or rapid filling. This is the period just after mitral valve opening, and this is occurring at the bottom left of the diagram. In rapid filling, the pressure in the left atrium is much higher than that of the left ventricle, and therefore all the blood from the left atrium goes into the left ventricle. And you can see that the volume begins to increase from left to right. The period after this phase four is phase five, which is also known as reduced filling. This is also known as diastasis. And this is the period just before mitral valve closure. From these diagrams, you can calculate stroke volume by taking the end diastolic volume, which is during phase one, and subtracting out the end systolic volume, which is phase three. You can also see from this diagram changes that occur and how they affect the different volumes in the heart. On the right side of the diagram, you can see that by increasing preload and by shifting phase one to the right, you increase stroke volume. This is also known as the Frank Starling mechanism, as we mentioned before. By increasing preload, by giving blood volume, for example, the heart will naturally have an increase in stroke volume due to the elastic properties of the myocardium. If you increase afterload, for example, by increasing aortic pressure, you can see that at the top of the diagram, the heart has to work harder and generate a higher pressure during phase one, or isovolumetric contraction. Because the heart is using more energy to overcome afterload, you see a drop in your stroke volume, and you see an increase in your end systolic volume. If you look at the top left of the diagram, you can see what occurs when contractility increases. When contractility increases, phase three is shifted to the left, which is represented by a decrease in end systolic volume, and therefore an increase in stroke volume and ejection fraction. To better explain the cardiac cycle, we have this diagram here that shows the different pressures in the different chambers in the heart, such as the aorta, the left ventricle, and the left atrium, followed by the heart sounds, which is shown just below that, followed by the left ventricular volume, followed by the jugular venous pulse, which is a representative of right atrial pressure, followed by the electrocardiogram. And at the very top of the diagram, you can see the different phases of the cardiac cycle. Phase one, which you can see is atrial systole, occurs right after the P wave in the EKG, the very bottom of the diagram. This P wave, as you know, is electrical activation of the cardiac myocytes in the atrium. Following the P wave, you should see an increase in pressure in the left atrium and the right atrium, which you do see. The first valve to close in the cardiac cycle is the mitral valve. The mitral valve closes, and you can see that at the very top of the diagram, followed by the S1. Remember that S1 is caused by mitral and tricuspid valve closure. The period between mitral valve closure and aortic valve opening, as you know, is isovolumetric contraction. And this is when the left ventricle is contracting, but no blood is ejecting yet. Once the left ventricular pressure increases to greater than that of the aorta, you have rapid ejection. Rapid ejection causes a decrease in left ventricular volume, which you can see in the ventricular volume curve. The rapid ejection then becomes reduced ejection, and then you see aortic valve closure. And remember that aortic and pulmonic valve closure is S2, or the second heart sound. After aortic valve closure, the left ventricular pressure drops. And once the left ventricular pressure drops to less than that of the left atrium, you will see rapid ventricular filling, and the ventricular volume will then begin to increase. The period of time between aortic valve closure 
and mitral valve opening is isovolumetric relaxation. Remember that S1, or the first heart sound, is caused by the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves, and it is loudest at the mitral valve listening post, which is the mid-axillary line in the fifth intercostal space. S2, or the second heart sound, is caused by closure of the aortic and the pulmonic valves. S2 is best heard at the upper sternal border, both at the left and the right side. S3, or the third heart sound, is heard in early diastole, and in patients above the age of 30, is considered pathologic. It's associated with elevated filling pressures and is generally associated with congestive heart failure. Children will often have an S3, and it will be considered normal in those patients, as well as pregnant women. S3 is basically caused by blood vibrating against a very overfilled chamber. S4, which is also known as the atrial kick, is always abnormal. S4 is heard just before S1, and it occurs in late diastole. S4 is representative of hypertrophic heart disease, or hypertensive heart disease, during which time the left atrium is pushing blood against a very stiff left ventricular wall. S3 and S4, when against the backdrop of tachycardia, are often called gallop rhythms. The jugular venous pulse, which is seen on the same diagram as the cardiac cycle, has three important waves that you should be aware of. The first wave is called the A wave and is a representative of atrial contraction. The C wave, which is a part of the A wave and is often seen as a bump on the downslope of the A wave, is caused by a right ventricular contraction when the tricuspid valve bulges into the right atrium. The V wave is not caused by ventricular contraction, which is a common misconception. The V wave is actually caused by passive filling of the right atrium. And the V wave peaks at the point where the tricuspid valve opens. The X descent occurs just after the A and the C waves, and the Y descent occurs just after the V wave. The second heart sound, which you are aware of, is caused by the aortic and the pulmonic valve closure, has a natural splitting phenomenon that occurs. With expiration, the A2 and the P2 component of the second heart sound move closer together. The A2 is the closure of the aortic valve, and the P2 is the closure of the pulmonic valve. When a person takes a deep breath in, this causes a decrease in intrathoracic pressure, which causes a temporary increase in venous return compared to cardiac output. And because the venous return increases, this increases the blood volume on the right side of the heart. And therefore, the right side of the heart just takes slightly longer to eject its volume of blood compared to the left side of the heart. Therefore, the pulmonic valve closure is slightly delayed. So with inspiration, for a few heartbeats, the pulmonic valve closure is slightly delayed compared to the aortic valve closure. And this is what's called a normal physiologic split of the S2. Wide splitting, which occurs with expiration and inspiration of the second heart sound, can be associated with either pulmonic stenosis or a right bundle branch block. Wide splitting of S2 is generally considered just an exaggeration of the normal split. Both pulmonic stenosis and right bundle branch block delay the flow of blood out of the right ventricle and therefore cause an increase in the amount of split because of a delay of P2. Remember that P2 is closure of the pulmonic valve. A fixed split is classically associated with an atrial septal defect. And the fixed split basically means that the amount of time between A2 and P2 is fixed and does not depend on expiration or inspiration. This fixed split occurs because of pressure gradients that occur between the atrium of the left side and the right side. Paradoxical splitting is associated with two different situations, 
aortic stenosis, and left bundle branch block. Both aortic stenosis and left bundle branch block delay the flow of blood out of the left ventricle and therefore delay A2 so much that it actually occurs after P2 during expiration. During inspiration, you see the normal delay of P2 so that P2 and A2 occur almost at the same time during inspiration, which is exactly the opposite of normal. Remember, under normal conditions, inspiration causes more of a split. With paradoxical splitting, however, it's expiration that causes more of a split. Remember that the normal splitting phenomenon occurs because of inspiration leading to a drop in intrathoracic pressure. This is because the diaphragm sinks lower and causes the pressure inside the chest cavity to drop. That increases the capacity of the pulmonary circulation and increases venous return. The pulmonic valve closes later just after this because it accommodates more blood entering the lungs from venous return compared to the left side of the heart. The aortic valve closes early. With wider splitting, this is again seen in conditions that delay right ventricular emptying, for example, pulmonic stenosis or right bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block delays right ventricular emptying because the electrical signal to the right ventricle is delayed by the block of the right bundle branch. A delay in right ventricular emptying causes a delay in the P2, regardless of breath cycle. A fixed split is seen with atrial septal defects. Remember that atrial septal defects lead to left to right shunts and therefore increase the flow through the pulmonic valve so that regardless of whether the patient is taking a breath in or out, the pulmonic closure is always greatly delayed because you have left to right shunting of blood. And this causes a greater amount of flow through the right side of the heart compared to the left side of the heart at rest. And therefore, P2 is always delayed compared to A2. With paradoxical splitting, you will hear a split S2 instead of upon inspiration with expiration. And this is seen in conditions that delay left ventricular emptying, such as aortic stenosis. With aortic stenosis, the left ventricle has difficulty expelling blood through the stenotic aortic valve, and therefore A2 is delayed. With a left bundle branch block, the left ventricle is electrically excited in a more delayed fashion because of complete blockade of the left bundle. The normal order of valve closure is reversed. Remember, normally A2 is before P2. With paradoxical splitting, the P2 sound occurs before the delayed A2 sound. Upon inspiration, the P2, because of increased venous return, is delayed so that P2 and A2 occur more closely together.